There are two narratives about the location of Osama bin Laden. The one that you're most familiar with is that UBL is hiding in a cave in the tribal areas, that he's surrounded by a large contingent of loyal fighters. But that narrative is pre-9-11 understanding of UBL. The second narrative is that he's living in a city, living in a city with multiple points of egress and entry, access to communications, so that he can keep in touch with the organization. You can't run a global network of interconnected cells from a cave. I was totally unaware, I have to say, when I saw this movie, how many women were actually involved in this. But see, that for me is the movie. It's, I think, I see it as a portrait of dedication. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where it moves out of the halls of government, so to speak, and becomes, you know, I think, I think, you know, something that can be inspiring to everybody. You know, like just, just the dedication of these professionals People who've worked, the, devoted their entire life, they work in the shadows, they have no um, public presence, nor should they, nor can they, and, and no, therefore no public acknowledgement or gratitude mm -hmm. is, is given to them just privately, but that you are made aware of this tremendous amount of dedication and service that these people are giving to you every day for us to have this conversation and feel safe having this conversation. There are people out there who are working very hard, day and night, mm -hmm. to achieve that. So I think that it's really finally a portrait of, of dedication and courage, tenacity, um, will, willfulness, <laughs> and, and uh, against almost impossible odds. And yes, there are women there. That was surprising to me. And I was actually surprised that I was surprised. <laughs> but um, but if it's interesting because both in Peter Bergen's book, Manhunt, and in Michael Scheuer's book, Osama bin Laden, mm -hmm. they comment on the predominance of women in intelligence. Well, you would have to get it, because you're Catherine Bigelow, <laughs> that these are women, where you've had movies that were mostly, although I remember Blue Steel really well, and Jamie Lee Curtis and that police uniform, and, what, right. and how she A was preparing hat. for this. Right. Yeah. But is this in your mind that people are going to think the movie is also making a feminist statement? Interesting. You know, it, it occurred to me, but then I, you know, it, it, I, I kind of um, felt what's most important is to be faithful to the research. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't in any way, uh, there was no agenda, there was, there was no agenda like that that mm -hmm. was part of the, um, the thinking behind this piece. You know, it was just let's, you know, let's try to reflect the research as best we can, as faithful as we can. Now, on the other hand, it's 10 years that's been compressed into two and a half hours. And it happens, the research happened to have revolved around many people many of whom were women. I don't know much about you privately, and I don't know much about Maya privately. When I watch this movie, she's a woman defined by the job she does. Is that a specific thing coming from Well, you? I think what's interesting, and I think what's a real true testament to Jessica Chastain's talent, that in these narrow windows of very rigorous dialogue, this beautifully finely calibrated performance that gives you her yearning, her eagerness, her disappointment. It gives you a universe in these narrow windows. And, and you know, the kind of, well, the conversation about backstory, do you need that to really inform? I would, I mean, I would say yes and no. You know, I think she gives you that. She gives you her expectations. She gives you her, her, her you know, courage. And of course, her will and her tenacity and her kind of psychological, de you know, dedication. But, um, but, uh, you know. So, and I think there's something about having the story unfold in the immediate. There mm -hmm. aren't other timelines that you can work with. You, you're compressing ten years into two and a half hours. You have enough there. It's a very dramatic story as it unfolds, as the facts unfold in and of themselves. And so, trying to create those sort of windows of opportunity. I think the actors did a magnificent job of giving you a sort of emotional, a complex emotional universe. Mark Bowl comes to you with a screenplay that, you know, you work on together, but you're still seeing this piece of reportage that he has. And then how do you approach it? 
do you approach it as if you were making something that was documentary like or do you approach it through a visual angle in your head because of your art background okay. how do you look at it a good question i mean a kind of all of the above i mean first first what's most important to me and this was very important to me in hurt locker too again is that idea of something being immediate and kind of unfolding in front of you in real time and to do that you need to put the audience put you peter in the shoes of those people how do you make it kind of an experiential relationship you have with the screen in other words that's you know that's you're you're as dedicated as they are you know finally and you're as 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 um, determined as they are so it's really making it um, feel very alive I then I choose a kind of camera that's alive I like to keep the ha camera hand held so it kind of keeps it alive but not in an impositional way not like showing um, off not showing yeah. off just keeping it just gently alive which hopefully is you know a, a quality that is either subconsciously or or somehow stimulates that idea of being in the middle of this hunt and then and then telling the story through their eyes and especially through the character of Maya and you you know you man or woman be can become on you know you're on her ride you're on her journey and her obsession and her determination and you know I think that that is something that's a question of is it a question of how you handle it visually I mean other than keeping the camera alive it's really keeping her alive in your sort of I don't know subconscious I mean how, I, I how hung on close-ups longer yeah. I, I studied you her do. face I study her her intensity and her uh, determination you know which is all and again you know having a great actor is I mean you can't do it without a great actor I don't think well let me ask you then as a last question a thing that relates to you making this film seeing it a million times in an editing room putting it together is there a moment in this movie after seeing it all that time that resonates for you as you not the best scene in the movie not anything but one that just says when I look at it over and over again I can say to myself this is what I wanted it to be that last shot on the plane mm -hmm. is the one that resonates the most um, personally because I feel it's that you know you're kind of caught between two worlds and you know I mean I'm I, I'm not referring to myself personally I'm referring to you know as a as a member of this country, mm -hmm. you know, and a proud member of this country and wanting to, you know, feel her pride, but at the same time, the um, grasping the scope and scale of what's before all of us, you know, and trying to embrace these issues and problems and, and, you know, again, the nobility of people that do nothing but this exclusively is um, fascinating to me. The nobility and also the confusion, the, the sense the of what was confusion. it, because that's what I see exactly. when, when I look at that. And I think that you've made a movie that the audience, when they see it, can take something home with them and discuss yeah. and come up with their own reasons for what they think happened. Yeah. Because I think whoever Maya is, or the real Maya, is going through that herself. So I just want to thank you for making movies like this thank and you. for being thank on the show. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You, thank you so, so much. It's great. We did it. And you didn't we did it. eat any And popcorn. I didn't eat any. <laughs> didn't eat any popcorn. I wasn't even tempted, anything. though. When, yeah. you, no, when you, you touched it's it disgusting. and it moved as a thing, it was it like... It can't be touched. It comes up in a piece. That was disgusting. Like,